Now, it is, of course, Thursday, and it's time uh, to catch up with Helen Dale. Helen, very good morning to you. Welcome. Morning, Mark. How are you? Very well, indeed. A lot of anger out there today with these new uh, lockdown rules. Just when you thought it was safe to get back into the high street, they've told you you can't go there with more than five other people. Yes, I'm I'm not quite sure what the logic behind this is, because they spend a lot of money, a lot of taxpayers' money. We know this now uh, with the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, right. which worked a rishi day. Mm. Lots of people went and had a rishi meal. You know, that was a thing. A hundred million and, meals were sold, by the way. So it yes, was a great success. Yes, so it, was a, it was a great success. And just when the hosp- hospitality sector is starting to come back, now you get this six person rule. And it seems, I mean, obviously, it's quite difficult to always get accurate information about this kind of stuff. But it seems that the rise in cases is all amongst young people. Yeah. People who are at almost no risk. Exactly. Well, I've got two sets uh, of sti- bizarre. statistics here in front of me, which are published in the Daily Mail, but freely available elsewhere. Uh, 41.6% of the infections in England per 100,000 uh, is now in the group between the ages of 20 and 29. And beneath that that figure, the death rates uh, in England by, by age group between the years 15 and 44, only 568 deaths. Hardly any. Well, yes, and uh, we, and of course, and young people notoriously, I mean, if they if they're going to die, they don't die of diseases like right. this. They, t- they well, certainly not coronavirus. They're much more likely to die in motor vehicle accidents or or drug uh, overdoses or something, or drug overdoses or or those kind of things. Mm. I mean, you really uh, what a lot of people have not got their head around yet is the fact that they see the daily COVID death figures and think, well, that's bad. You know, a couple hundred people or that kind of thing. That's a that's a bad figure. Not realizing. All the other things from which people die in across all age groups uh, are much, much higher numbers. I mean, there was a very good interview on trigonometry with uh, Professor Carol Sikora, the Sikora, the oncologist. Mm. And he was going through the, so, all the other things that aren't being dealt with as a result of coronavirus. And of course, he's got a particular interest in cancer because that's where he works. Mm. I mean, he's an oncologist, he's a consultant. Uh, so the, it's... Um, I, I, I'm not. Un, I don't understand the logic behind this. It's authoritarian. It's petty, and uh, it doesn't. I don't think it'll do anything. No, I mean, all it does is <sighs> irritate those who are more, say, libertarian in their outlook on life, and then frighten those uh, who are likely to be more frightened. That's all it does. Well, yes, and it. And the the thing is, I mean, you you mentioned uh, uh, to me privately, but I don't think it hurts to discuss it now uh, in australia the one uh, australia is a federal system so all the states do their own thing basically yeah. that's how federalism works but one state victoria um has had a rise in cases and it, and not to put too fine a point on it it cocked up a policy uh, the, uh, the hotel quarantines mm. and it meant that they finished up with covid clusters everywhere and people were dying it did get a lot worse but to put that in context victoria is australia's worst state but it's still doing better if you look at the overall statistical picture mm. than Germany, right. which is the European Union plus the UK, because we're not in the EU anymore. It's doing better than Germany, which right. is the EU's best state. Mm. So there's this, it been this enormous overreaction in Victoria. And up until now, it had divided politically in that people on the, the, the left, and I'm I've started to call them the lockdown left, uh, were broadly in favour of the draconian measures from the Victorian government. And people on the the right, even conservatives, not necessarily libertarians, were getting sick of it and saying, no, this needs to stop. Mm. And then an incident happened yesterday to a personal friend of mine, Professor Katie Barnett, who's a, a very distinguished legal academic at the University of Melbourne. So the kind of person who has a bit more of a megaphone than the average Joe. And among other things, uh, Professor Barnett has cerebral palsy right. and she's receiving treatment for it. And she had a round of injections and was under medical instructions to go for a walk every day right. so that the in, the stuff she's had injected into her legs, because cerebral palsy makes people do that odd scissor walk, uh, goes through mm. the muscle. Or right. Otherwise, the, the treatment won't work. 
And she's tried very deliberately to support a local cafe in the part of Melbourne where she lives. So she walked to this cafe, bought a coffee, and then was in the process of walking back home very slowly. Remember, this is a woman with cerebral yeah. palsy and got rounded up by Victoria police and moved on. On what basis? Walk, on, on what basis did they did they? You're not her up? allowed. You're not allowed to pause and drink your coffee. Really, you have to keep moving. That's what she was told to her face. That's and and the the thing that alarmed her was that originally she was dealing with two police officers, mm. and she just walked away very very slowly because she can't go any faster. But then, as she was walking past some local shops just to get back to her house. Um, she noticed there were more and more police congregating and she now doesn't think that they were following her. But at, at the time, she was quite alarmed. And, yeah. I mean, this is one of the things people from that sort of background and in that sort of and in the legal profession, unless you're a criminal at the criminal bar and Katie isn't, she's a private lawyer. So she deals with contract law and commercial law. Uh, you don't deal with the police very often. You think, Am I being followed? Mm. And then she realised what had actually happened was the... Um, that someone had been a curtain twitcher, the Australian equivalent of a curtain twitcher, and they're called dobbers in Australia, right. had actually called the police and said, oh, too many people are congregating at that lot of shops. Right. That's ridiculous, so isn't it? And it's is, just producing yeah. the most extraordinary behaviour. But what has happened with Professor Barnett is that because of her status and the fact that she is perceived in, in Victoria as a very even-handed sort of person, for once now, you've you've got the left-leaning people going, no, this is ridiculous and it has to stop. This is just a gross intrusion on people's civil liberties, uh, whereas that hadn't happened up until now. It had been divided politically, whereas now, and also we're now seeing here in the UK, people on the political left who've been the, the lockdown left, as I call them, particularly lawyers, are starting to say, no, we don't have government by diktat. This, this rule of six, as it was being called yesterday, is just ridiculous mm. and petty and trivial and doesn't do anything and and seemingly also kind of arbitrary i mean you know why six yes. why not why not seven why, six? why not i mean i and, was out for coincidentally i happened to be out for lunch with a bunch of old friends yesterday who i hadn't seen for ages and there were seven of us as it turned out because the restaurant we were in wasn't um, a massive restaurant with massive big tables we had two tables one of four and one of three now technically yeah. that's still okay so we can still have another lunch next week even though there's seven of us Yes, I'm not quite sure what, what the point of, of this is and, and what they're hoping to achieve. And someone did make the point yesterday, hang on, isn't this worse? Because you could have six people from six different households as long yeah. as it's only six. Right. Yeah. So I don't where's know. the logic? There is no logic to it, it seems to me. And that's what I think people are now getting absolutely fed up to the back teeth of. Because with every law that comes in and every kind of suggested law, um, it doesn't appear to do any good. And a lot of people are asking me now as well, um, hang on a minute. Seemingly, we've got this increase in infections, albeit from younger people, but we've got it ever since they brought the compulsory wearing of masks in. So what are the masks doing? Well, I don't know. The, I mean, I've read so much conflicting stuff on the mask yeah. issue. I honestly do not know what is right. I will make one very brief comment, though, and that is whilst the countries, most of the countries that did best in their management of COVID-19 mm. were countries with a historical tradition of wearing masks like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. Two of the countries that did extremely well in their management of COVID-19, Australia and New Zealand, don't have a historic culture of wearing masks mm. and there were no mask mandates. And interestingly, in Victoria now, they've tried to introduce mask mandates and they're getting resistance. Mm. And there seems to be some evidence that uh, that kind of telling people to cover their face in populations of mainly Caucasian and African descent just doesn't go down well. It, it's not gone down well in South Africa either. Mm. And, you, and and that's mostly black people. And the, yeah. and the South Africans are just going, oh, get lost. This is becoming ridiculous yeah. and over the top. So, yeah. And I think uh, that's where it's all going to end up. But let's talk about the, the realignment as well, because that was how we were going to originally start this conversation until yes. the new well, that's crazy, the, uh, the new book. Now, this is a book that you've been um, perusing and reviewing. So tell us about it. Well, Stephen Davies is a political historian and he is the one that came up with the realignment thesis, which is uh, basically Brexit wasn't something super special. You think it is. You think it's this major shift in politics. But he argued that the shifts were already happening. And so mm. he talks about Brexit being a catalyst 
in the sense of a chemical reaction rather than a cause right. of what happened. And basically what has happened is that the salience of economics and economic issues has dropped and the salience of identity and cultural issues, not necessarily culture war issues, he's very careful to draw that distinction mm. in the book, um, have become more important to people. And one of the ways they showed this was in this, the vote in 2016 and then in 2019, but also, and he's very careful to, to make this point, also in the behaviour of a certain sort of what he calls radical remainers, mm. which were people who wanted to overturn an election result, effectively. Yeah. And uh, as I wrote in my piece today for CapEx, at the time, I thought, well, you know, this is a bit, this is ridiculous and a bit over the top. And I was critical of it in my journalism that I wrote for various outlets. But it took a friend from Lebanon who has lived through some of the dreadful things that have happened in Lebanon. Now, this was before the, the terrible explosion that, that happened earlier this year. But I mean, Lebanon has had civil wars and contested results and all sorts of social problems. And Army, and my friend was the one, and I actually went to visit him at his hotel. And uh, there was one of the big 400,000 people, people's vote marches. Mm. She just don't appreciate how big they are right. going down the street. And he said, all these people want to overturn an election result. And in my country and in my part of the world, the Middle East, when that happens, the next thing is a civil war. Yeah. The whole point of it's democracy about, it's about is that you resolve things peacefully. And it's also about consent. acceptance and ex yes. accepting it. And he reminded me of just how utterly cranky, in the sense of cranks, the whole idea of rerunning the vote actually was. And, and it was a bit of a whack in the head for me. And that's the great virtue of Steve Davies's book, is he just goes into how cranky People who really should know better and who knew a lot about the governance of the United Kingdom, who knew a lot about its politics and its history and were well aware that, you know, the party system, Britain was the first country to have it. It started in 1671. It goes back a long time. People who knew better really were, were letting the side down in, in doing this. Mm. And then, of course, we've seen, you know, and then he talks about the conspiracism and the silly nonsense like the Russia conspiracies and the Boris baby conspiracies and all these other conspiracies from people who are, people who are really very well educated, yeah. very privileged, have every advantage in life and are coming out with absolute crank nonsense, nonsense right. that's every bit as cranky as saying that 5G causes coronavirus, and, basically. And, and, and also, do you know what's interesting for me, and without wishing to, to disparage uh, your profession or one of your many professions, a lot of these lawyers <laughs> are to blame for it. Jolian Morm, or Jolian Moron, as I like to call him, is a, even as we speak, producing Captain more... Fox killer. Yeah, yeah, Captain yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Kim <laughs> Kimono My House. I mean, this is a guy who is already now working on another lawsuit against the government to try and stop them from in his words breaking the law in Northern Ireland because they want to change something that the EU've drawn up that we don't want to well, do anymore. Is, well this is this is another point that Steve Davies thinks that there's a whole chapter on it and I strongly recommend you you, you give a, a read of his book or the, the section of it. He thinks the big dispute over the next five to ten years in British politics is going to be how the UK relates to not only international law and the power of the interpretation, interpretive power of the judiciary with respect to international law, but also locally, because there are people in you know, domestically, because there are people in this country, like there's a barrister I know who I have a lot of time for, Francis Ha, who's actually running a test case, a judicial review case, as in the same sort of case that Gina Miller ran, mm. to do with these rule, the rule of six nonsense. Right. And a lot of people would say, well, that's where you want judicial review. You want it to use it to be able to challenge your own government when it does something silly. But the thing is, judicial review can also be used to use international law as a stick yeah. with which to beat your national government. And a lot of people, and it's very clear, and Davies talks about this, a lot of people really, really object to that. And he thinks the sort of the global rules-based order and the sort of the role of international law he thinks it's on the way out. The expression he uses in the book is politically exhausted mm. because people really, really resent something that they think should be used to clip the government's wings in their own country 
being used to clip the government's wings externally, yeah. but without any democratic mandate. Yes, yeah. and that uh, is so the problem it, with the law, and always has been the problem with the law, that you don't use the law and you shouldn't use the law uh, to act politically. It's not meant to be used that way. Well, it, that's the thing. Well, it's certainly not meant to be used that way in Commonwealth countries. One of the big problems and one of the reasons why there are so many problems in the United States is precisely because their judicial appointments, whilst all the people on the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, are eminent lawyers and very clever, mm. regardless of their politics, they are perceived and to an extent are the vehicles of, of politics and yes. political appointments. Yes. And so you get these terrible fights in America and the, the, the three big ones, abortion, gun laws and same-sex marriage right. and they're all to do with the fact that the decisions that have been made about those whether from the right or from the left are judi judicial decisions by people who aren't elected and they're not the decisions of the electorate yes and oh you don't want that here it's horrible american politics is awful because no. of that but we've got tony blair to, we've got well, we've got tony blair to thank for taking a step in that direction by the setting up of the supreme court which of course yes. nobody really wanted him to do uh, but no. we've now seen the danger of him doing that Yes, uh, uh, and the last thing you want is the politicization of the judiciary it's it's just dreadful no. although i do think it's worth noting that quite a lot of the people who were lawyers on the human rights left and would be very angry with the government over the over abrogating a bit of international law um, are also now saying no 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 this rule of six and this the lockdown is becoming ridiculous and over the top and it's impinging on civil liberty so you've got this awkward situation where sometimes those lawyers uh yeah you know, they're making a relevant point about domestic law but they're making a very anti-democratic point about international law. So you've, I mean, I saw a, a woman who was actually a former MEP for the Brexit party re retweeting Adam Wagner, who's one of the big human rights types, because they happen to agree, agree mm. on this rule of six. Right. So it's quite a complicated issue. And Steve Davies does go into that, you know, how much control should electoral majorities have within their own country? And what should the relationship between electoral majorities in that country have to international law. And I will make one little legal observation here based on my professional experience. What HM government is doing now with the Northern Ireland Protocol is much, much smaller in terms of its international law abrogation than Australia has done with the 1951 Refugee Conven Convention. Australia has effectively abrogated an entire convention and nothing happened. Mm. And one of the things you're taught at law school is that a great flaw of international law is that if a national sovereign state gives it the flick and says, I've just been vulgar in BSL, but anyway, um, gives it the flick and says, no, we, we don't want to do that. There is actually very, very little that happens to them right. and nothing happened to Australia. Right. And that's because international law lacks a sovereign it yes, and and, and, all, and, and all you really yes, and all you really have is a load of lawyers. Listen, Helen, we're going to leave it there. Thanks very much indeed for talking to us once more.